Dear friends in Christ, beloved brothers in office, especially you, my dear brother Dave, and your precious Joe, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The prophet Isaiah has a word for us today. He was God's man for a people locked in a crisis very much like our own. God's people Israel in Isaiah's day were in desperate need of renewal and hope. They had grown, grown complacent over the centuries. And by Isaiah's time, Judah and Jerusalem, the holy city, were only going through the motions of godliness. Oh, everything looked like it was in fine shape. The temple sacrifices and the sacred liturgy were still performed day after day as prescribed in the law of the Lord. And it was done with meticulous precision and care. But they were empty gestures, devoid of meaning. These people, though they knew better, worshipped God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. They had given in to the idolatries and adulteries of the pagans among whom they lived. And so their religion was only skin deep. Israel's godlessness by this time had become system systemic. Idolatry was rampant. And so God took some drastic action to jolt them out of their faithlessness and idolatry. And it was all detailed in the words which God put into the mouth of Isaiah to speak on his behalf. It was not a pleasant message. God's people would be invaded by the mighty Assyrian Empire, and they would be all carried away into exile. Their cities would be utterly devastated, their land laid waste, and only a remnant would be left one day to return. Now, of course, we need to be a little careful about making too many direct connections between ancient Israel and modern-day America and our present predicament. But I think this much is certain, and I believe you'll agree with me, that God often uses great calamity to get his point across. As C.S. Lewis once wrote very pointedly, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences. But he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. There's just no shortcut from chaos to security. The way out of our mess is the same as it was for Israel. Repentance and faith. Which brings us, of course, back to our text, which is a good place to be. In the lesson that we heard today, God speaks the inconvenient truth to his wayward people through the mouth of his prophet. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Again, outwardly, things were just fine in Judah and Jerusalem and the land of Israel when it came to food. In the marketplaces, vendors' stalls were full of delectable foods. The fields still yielded their crops in due season. But inwardly, the people were famished. They were starving to death spiritually. They were a mess when it came to God. 
Their priorities were all out of whack. They invested their time and money in all the wrong places. And that's pretty much us too, isn't it? Collectively, we have been spending our money for that which is not bread and expending our labor for that which does not satisfy. You could say we've all been living on borrowed capital, spiritually speaking, and now we've begun to pay a very high rate of interest. These calamities which we've been undergoing of late could be a good thing for Christ Church if they help us sort things out and not just return to business as usual after it's all over, if it's ever all over. This pandemic could be a good thing if it helps us to realize that all the glitz and showbiz that too often has characterized American church life is only empty bling. The one thing needful is to gather together in God's house to hear the life-giving word of the Lord and to receive his sacraments, which are chock full of the life that is in Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. All the social unrest and political turmoil, the tribalism of our social media, the screaming heads on our talk shows may ultimately help God's people realize that we've been spending our money on that which is not bread when we ought to focus on Jesus Christ, the living bread from heaven who came down to bring life to the world. Not to be served, as he said, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The life of the church hinges around Jesus, the bread of life. Tend his sheep and lambs with his living word and life-giving sacrament. That's what it's all about. That's where doxology comes into focus. <clears throat> Despite all the reasons that gave rise to holding this event here, I think it's a blessing that this event can be held here in this church. My memory ain't so good, but as best I can tell, it was nearly 25 years ago that Bev Yankee and I began a conversation about the care of souls here in Elm Grove Evangelical Lutheran Church. And we hosted so many meetings right down the hall back here behind us in the Bartelt Center Little did we ever dream back in those early days that after all the years of research and study, those initial conversations would bear such mighty fruit. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit has richly blessed the work that originated here in this church and now has enriched the lives of thousands of people all over the world as their pastors were strengthened and equipped with tools to enhance their skills as physicians of blood-bought souls, bringing Christ's gifts to hurting and sorrowing saints, and equipping churches just like yours to be beacons of light in an ever-darkening world. What a joy it is then for me personally today to have a part in passing the baton of spiritual care leadership into your capable hands, Dave, so that you and Bev can carry that conversation about the care of souls on into these tumultuous times and beyond. It all began with our gracious God himself. From Isaiah 
to the disciples who gathered up 12 baskets full of leftovers that day that Jesus fed the crowd with only five loaves and two fish by the seashore. And on, then on, fast forward into the future to Augustine, to Luther, to Walther, and to this very day. The Lord has seen fit to bring the bread of life through his, to, through his called servants who are engaged in the ongoing conversation about the care of souls. And I believe, Dave, that you are singularly well equipped for that conversation because you know that the topic of that conversation is not you. <laughs> Along with the Apostle Paul, you never preach yourself. I've heard you over the years many times. But Jesus Christ is Lord with you as his servant. An errand boy for Jesus, as it were, bringing out the gifts that he earned by the blood and passion of his cross, his innocent suffering and death, and his glorious resurrection into never-ending life. Though these gifts of Christ's forgiveness, life, and salvation are of inestimable value, they are a wonder of wonders free of charge to all comers. In these dark days of isolation and calamity, of turmoil on our streets and in our hearts, there is still an abundant feast available free of charge to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Here's the way Isaiah puts it. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to waters. Come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And we've seen that over and over again in these years in doxology. Over the 12 seasons that we've been at this blessed work in doxology, we've discovered that those who bring the gifts need them too. There are plenty of pastors who are themselves slowly strangling under the burden of ministry, worn out emotionally and strung out spiritually. They themselves need the nutrients of the royal feast they are called to dispense. And I believe that you are singularly well equipped, my brother, to shepherd these starving souls of the shepherds of Christ's church, so they will find renewed courage and hope in the Lord who has called them into his vineyard. For you are a true pastor's pastor, and you are remarkably well equipped to comfort these men with a comfort with which you have been comforted by God. Oh, I'm sure it won't be a walk in the park. There may be days ahead when you wonder what you've gotten yourself into. <laughs> because after all, the old evil foe does not like it when Christ's servants are well equipped for service in his kingdom. So you can count on it that Satan will do his level best to undermine the work that you undertake today. But remember, there is one who fights for you that is mightier than he. The Lord Christ, whose servant you are, will strengthen your heart to be valiant in the work of training and equipping faithful sheepdogs of the Great Shepherd to serve his beloved sheep and lambs in his name and stead. So resting in his mighty word, feasting on his body and blood once given and shed for you, Jesus, will himself certainly nourish you every step of the way. So now, the Holy Spirit mightily bless and equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, that in these gray and latter days there may be those whose song is praise, each life a high doxology unto the Holy Trinity. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.